G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and I'd like to give Best Fiends a big shout out for sponsoring this episode. So, a while back, I started looking for a matching puzzle game that could give me a good challenge. Something requiring more than just the same basic strategy round after round. But the more I searched, the more I wondered if I'd ever find what I was looking for. And then, I came across Best Fiends. It's a mobile puzzle game that always leaves your brain feeling refreshingly challenged. In a lot of ways, it reminds me of camping or hiking with my friends, in fact. What I mean is that it's a great way to spend downtime re-energizing while also still being a lot of fun. Best Fiends is now my go-to game at night when I'm chilling in bed and can't sleep as well. In fact, some mornings I even catch myself getting up a little earlier than normal just to get in a few more levels before the day begins. And it's always a bit of a challenge to put the game down these days. But that's not a problem because Best Fiends never runs out of things to do. From thousands of fun puzzles to solve to new events always coming online, I always have more to chew through. And one of my favourite things to do currently is to collect some of the rare fiends through some of these events. It's so satisfying when you finally get hold of one of the rare fiends too because they offer a lot of gameplay options and assist with some of the harder levels in really meaningful ways. The game also even has some nice little animated shorts coming out with the events too, which is a really nice touch of flavour for the game. But maybe you're like me and have some doubts about finding a puzzle game with more to offer. My advice? Give Best Fiends a try. Just don't blame me if you can't put it down. Download the 5 star rated puzzle game Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. My grandparents moved from Ohio in the late 70s to start a life in Florida. An opportunity to manage a ranch was a dream come true for them. When I was about 8 years old, I used to visit them once a month for around 2 weeks each day. I loved it too. The smell of cow manure brings back a lot of special times in my life for me. But it also brings back horrifying memories too. The ranch is located in Florida... I don't want to give the name of the ranch for obvious reasons. Not much history was given to my grandparents before arriving. It was only shortly after that the owner started to spill the beans. But bound by contract, my grandparents had an obligation to stay for the span of 10 years. The land had some native history as well as some other unfortunate stuff in the front house of the property. An old navy sailor apparently ended everything several years beforehand there. The land has several different ponds and trails which made for some awesome adventures. I had lots of fun there, that is, until my strange experience. So my father and I, we decided to go fishing at one of the more interesting ponds. At that time I had no idea what made this pond so interesting but later when I was an adult I was told why. The pond was shaped like a donut and a small mound at the center of the pond, around 45 feet from the shore from all, it was perfectly centered. From my understanding, someone was buried at the center of this pond. I'm not sure if that is true actually, but mostly stories and no real evidence. Anyhow, my father and I began fishing. I grabbed my small bait caster sized rod and began hooking a worm to my hook. I used a little red and white bobber. I was the type that wanted to fish away from someone as I thought it would raise my chance of actually catching something, but little did I know that that day something caught me. I cast my line in the water and sat down right at the edge of the water with my feet slightly in. Felt like a man too with my rubber boots on like that, just like my old man. After about 20 minutes or so, I noticed my bobber going under and back up, so I decided to set my hook. As I tugged back, it felt like something big was on the line. I tugged and reeled, tugged harder and reeled again, and my line wouldn't let go. It was stuck on something. At this point, my father was on the other side of the mound and out of sight. So, in big boy fashion, I decided to walk into the water to see if I could tug it into a different direction, possibly freeing my line. I figured that I was snagged on something. I'm about four feet in the water and was just at the edge of my knee-high boots. Not sure if that makes sense, but I feel like it was what I was supposed to do. 
anyway. Finally, after tugging my line even harder, it was freed as if nothing was on it in the first place, and even my worm was still hanging off the hook. Feeling proud now, though, I decided to walk out of the water and recast my line again. But this is where it just gets absolutely crazy. So, about one feet away from being completely out of the water, my left foot slipped on a rock in the water. I brought my right foot forward to catch my balance, as you do, and a smaller stone dug itself into the shin of my left leg, hurting so much. As I realize what just happened, I go to pull my left leg forward, but I just couldn't. I felt my foot pulling backwards. I struggled trying to pull my leg forward, even spinning around with my bum now in the water. I started to scream, yelling for my father, and it was as if my scream just fell on deaf ears. I'm being pulled into the water by something. It didn't feel like hands or anything actually on my foot. Just my leg was not free any longer, and... I was gradually going further into the water. I was yelling at the top of my lungs at this point, and after about 20 seconds of fighting and yelling, whatever had my left foot just let go. I was soaked and horrified. I immediately got up and ran to my father screaming, bleeding from my left leg, and in somewhat of a, a shock, I guess. While yelling, I asked my father, why didn't you come when I was screaming? And my father was now shaking because of my reaction and said, Son, I didn't hear you screaming. I couldn't see you from this side. I'm calming down a little at this point and I asked him again and his reply was the same. I just didn't hear you, son. Needless to say, after showing my father and explaining what happened to me, like most parents would, he just shrugged it off and said, My imagination got the best of me. I never did fish on the property again after that. No one believes that this actually happened, and trust me, I know that this sounds outlandish to say the least. But I'm not here to convince you, I, I just want to share it. Has anyone else ever felt something similar? Sorry for the convoluted parts of the story, I also have a few more creepy experiences that happened prior to this one, but I'll share those in regards to this ranch some other time. Anyway, thanks for listening. This story needs background to convey some factors that were potentially involved. I suspect the events leading up to the trip to Tennessee... They may have had a direct relation to the severity of the phenomenon that we experienced while there. So, I had never wanted to marry, neither had my now husband. But then we met each other. Well, we were engaged at 30 and 28 years old and had a two-year engagement. But we wanted our wedding to symbolize our true soul bond and decided to go completely non-traditional. His giant family wanted a white dress Catholic wedding... So, we were at major odds with the family from day one. My fiancé and I began suffering from a huge run of exceptionally bad luck and some odd poltergeist activity at home. Nothing too major, but we just brushed it off. Except when we left the house once and came back to find a red clown nose sitting front and center on our bathroom sink. No one had keys to our place, and we didn't own a clown nose, so that one was freaky. When I told a friend that something weird was going on, to the point where I almost felt like the wedding was cursed, he was trying to explain it away, and I said, Watch, something's going to happen today while he's getting his tux, I'm telling you. I get one flabbergasted look before my fiancé immediately called to say that there had been a freak accident in the parking lot while he was getting fitted for his tux, and someone had totaled the back end of his truck. That shut my friend up real quick. Another glitch was my refusal to have my father walk me down the aisle. I also refused a random stand-in for tradition's sake, and I asked my younger brother, and he said that he would be so honest. When we'd had some problems, but he'd been clean for seven years and we'd made up our differences. But losing our middle brother to a drunk driver had driven us apart for a while, but brought us back closer a little later down the road. 
then, 40 days before the wedding, my brother unintentionally ended his own life in his mid-twenties. My fiancé and I drove over 16 hours, close to Point Pleasant, to say goodbye. I knew my brother, and I knew that he would not cross over easily with what he'd done, especially with my wedding around the corner and me counting on him. And this really bothered me. His viewing was close to immediate family only. He was not embalmed due to the complete autopsy required. He was covered in a handmade quilt to his chin, where we were instructed not to touch him, although we ignored his stricture. After saying our goodbyes, I walked to the end of his gurney and lay my hands on his feet, a supplicant. I told him I understood that it was an accident and I forgave him. I told him that if he still felt that he needed to make amends with me, then he could do so by calling forth my loved ones and those of my fiancé to come witness the wedding from the other side. I bade him to bring our other brother, my fiancé's sister, grandparents, aunts, friends. I began calling by name all of those loved souls whom had already passed. Do this, I told him, and there'll be no debt between us and you can rest in peace. The looks on my family's faces were priceless at this point, but I felt that this was something that I needed to offer. I had a pendant made when I returned to New Orleans. On it was my favourite picture of my two brothers, I wrapped this around my bouquet and, although it seemed to the wedding guests that I walked the aisle alone, I knew that both my sweet brothers were right beside me in spirit, because they would never miss the wedding of their sister, especially with Hector actively dragging them across the veil to fulfill his last obligation to the living. So, my new husband, Eli, and I went to a rental cabin on Bluff Mountain for a honeymoon week. I don't want to name the specific cabin in case I'm not supposed to, but... I will say that it was very rocky and with a raccoon theme. Bluff Mountain is in Pigeon Forge, outside of Glattenburg in the Smoky Mountains. I was living in New Orleans and had brought a double handful of fresh-picked gardenia blossoms with me. It was a, a type of symbolic offering to the mountain for having us on such a special occasion. No rituals or anything, I simply arranged them on a wooden box with a fake bird and nest that was sitting on the top of the railing of the cabin porch and sent up feelings of gratitude and joy. We went out to eat and grab groceries. Upon arriving back at the cabin, the wooden bird box was smashed into a million pieces on the porch. It hit the ground hard to shatter so far and so thoroughly like that though. We thought that maybe a raccoon or a bear had hit it or something. But then I noticed that there were no flowers anymore. Maybe the wind? Leaves were scattered all over the porch just like when we left and that made me hesitate. Gardenias aren't super light flowers, definitely heavier than the leaves that I saw. I'm more curious than anything though. I looked around the porch, the stairs and the walkway I shrugged it off until the next morning when I went a little way down the driveway to pick some honeysuckle and about 20 feet from the porch I glanced down and do a double take because there are my gardenias, like all of them. They've been piled up and sort of squished flat as crepes. There's no shoe prints but it took more than one stomp to flatten the pile like that. Unnerved, I just sort of walked away wondering if the mountain didn't like my offering after all and then laughing at myself for that thought. So night one, Eli wakes suddenly to what sounds like something big banging the support beams under the cabin. The cabin hangs off the side of a hill so the front half is supported by about 15 feet of the forest floor by giant wooden posts and they were being hit so hard that the mirror on the wall was vibrating which frankly should be physically impossible for anyone to do. He says every time that he started to drift back off that there was another bang too. He gets up fully and after one more cabin shaking bang, he decides to wake me up. Apparently he was trying to see if I would wake up from the banging so that he would know that he wasn't dreaming. But now he was 100% up. As he reaches for me, he said the loudest bang or slap came from the area between the sitting area and the kitchen, right at the bottom of the bed. It was a one-room cabin. He said that it sounded like a giant book getting dropped from high up, but he was looking right there and there, and there was nothing. This bang, though, was definitely inside the cabin, he said. 
He began frantically trying to wake me up, but he said that I was so deeply asleep that he actually thought something was wrong with me. He said that he could barely tell that I was breathing, in fact. Then, this strange metallic jangling sounded from behind the TV, directly across the cabin from our bed. He said that it went on forever, but he was too scared to go and look for whatever it was. Over there, next to the huge windows, past the spot where the noise originated from inside. It was this insistent buzzing that finally woke me up though. I remember it was so hard to come back to consciousness. I felt like I was literally swimming through blackness to get back to myself. I kept asking myself, what is that noise? I thought that it was an alarm that someone left set. When I finally woke up enough to move though and sat up to go and find and smash the offending noisemaker, the trilling just all of a sudden stopped. Groaning now, I fell backwards onto my pillow. Eli starts telling me about the banging and I could tell how upset my husband was. I believed what he was telling me, but I was so numb and out of it that I was struggling to come up with my emotional response at all. There was only this sort of debilitating fatigue and I fell asleep on my husband when he needed me. When a man whom I'd never seen afraid in seven years was completely terrified... I just sort of zonked out till morning. Normally, uh, I'm an extremely light sleeper, especially in new places. This trip, however, almost every night was like this. No sooner did I put my head on the pillow than I was swallowed by blackness. It was an extremely deep sleep, but it just wasn't restful at all. Waking up was worse. It felt like I was falling into a coma every night and slowly reviving every morning. It, ironically, left me exhausted. On the second day and night, while doing my makeup in the infamous shaking mirror the next morning, I was able to get the full story and talk to Eli about it logically. Maybe a bear was rubbing against the post. He says, it was solid bangs like a huge fist, no way a bear. And what about the one from the center of the floor, on the inside? That reminded me of that stupid alarm as well, and... I told him that I was about to disable that thing. At the exact second I mentioned it too, that noise started blaring from behind the TV again. We both jumped like rabbits and sort of laughed nervously. <sighs> Way to time it, I joked. Looking behind the TV, I was surprised to see that it wasn't an alarm clock, but a landline phone. An old one with a bell buzzer, which did explain the horrid noise. Of course, I had to answer it. There was a minute of silence and then just bursts of static. It really sounded like someone was talking, but static was obscuring their words. I told them to move to get better reception. Is this cabin management? The silence or garbled talk continued for a while before eventually I just hung up. I was amused, honestly, especially with the way Eli was gaping at me. When I hung up, he immediately unplugged the phone, said management had both our cells, so it was probably a prank call from someone who stayed here before, but we're not playing along and ended up in a deliverance scenario. Smart man. The phone stayed unplugged for the duration. That night, we were in the hot tub on the deck. It was around the back, had a gazebo type cover around three sides, and no lights too close so bugs wouldn't be swarming you. As we're relaxing, I'm sitting on the open end facing the enclosing wooden strips and Eli's facing me in the forest. I kept admiring the blue light behind the enclosed end. It was large, about the size of a maybe a cantaloupe and seemed bright, but the glow over us in the hot tub was very muted. I figured it must be LED of some sort, but I had never seen a light that shade of blue anywhere. All of the other lights in and around the cabin were bright and orangey, so I remember saying how it was sort of sweet that they went all out for mood lighting for the hot tub. Eli both looked at and commented on the light as well, and when we decided to get out for the night, the light blinked on and off in what looked like a purposeful sequence before shining a few more seconds and going dark. We commented that it was strange how the light just burnt out like that, and how we were sad to lose our mood lighting. I decided to call the next morning for a bulb, and when I woke up, 
I first walked around the rear of the cabin to see what type of pole or other fixture was the one that we needed serviced. There was no pole, fixture, or any other light source behind the hot tub. No cables, no wires. The main officer later confirmed the instability of the soil back there prevented anything that wasn't heavy duty from being installed, so no lighting was ever put back there. So, whatever that light was, we both saw it and it was apparently just eavesdropping. Because we were out there for like two hours and so was it. And it wasn't turning off or burning out. And that means that it was straight up disappearing. Starting this second night after coming in, my skin started to crawl and every hair on my body stood on end every time that I passed that open bathroom. The bathroom was next to the bed area. Laying in the bed, you could see the bathroom sink and the small window above it. The window had no curtains as it faced into the woods behind the hot tub. And at this point, I honestly still thought that the blue light was man-made. Yet, I could swear that there was something looking in the window. I'd been leaving the bathroom door open because I liked looking out into the forest from the bed, but now I tried to keep it shut without Eli noticing I was being weird for sure, but Eli told me the next morning that every time that he would start to drift off, a resounding bang on the post under the cabin would jolt him up again. He said that he was freaked out too, because no matter how long or short a time that he waited to lay his head down, it was like whatever it was knew exactly what he was doing, even though he never got out of bed. Once again, he was wide awake and also terrified, and nothing he could do would rouse me, even the slightest. On the third night, after scrubbing ourselves as best as we could in the highly stinky sulfuric water of the cabin, we were getting ready for bed. Walking from the bathroom to the bed, I realized that I forgot to shut the bathroom door. Since Eli was already laying in the bed looking at me, I just kept on toward my side of the bed, telling myself to stop being so ridiculous. Even though I could have sworn that at that moment, something was looking in that window. I had already looked out several times though and I couldn't see anything out of place. But, I don't know, I could still feel it. Eli quietly asks me if I can shut the door. Why, I ask. Because that window gives me the creeps. Talk about validation, right? That night too, I had some really disturbing dreams, but I can't really remember them. Eli, however, suffered a severe bout of SP that night, although he swore it wasn't SP because he says that he sat up, kicked and yelled at her. Now, however, he says that it was probably SP, but either way, he woke up to eerie laughter and saw what he described as a grudge-type woman standing at the end of the bed laughing at him. I, again, wouldn't wake, and he said that she wore a white dress, had pale skin, black eyes and horrible mouth, Long black hair, partially obscuring her face and was surrounded by a swirling black mist. She reached for him and he sat up yanking his legs up to his chest. And this is when he started yelling at her to get out and kicking at her. And laughing, she eventually faded out. He said that he was woken by her grabbing his ankles and giggling throughout the night and would also wake just long enough to catch glimpses of her and again, I was still no help. Night 4, repeat the sleep paralysis experience for Eli, but he said that even more intense, the same lady in white, I'd also realized that a trinket that I brought for luck had been put on the shelf next to my side of the bed was now missing. It was a tiny cabin and we tore it up looking for the next two days, but we never did see it again. It was worthless pretty much, except for I guess personal reasons and no valuables were missing so I don't think someone came in and like snagged it or anything. On night five, whenever I sat up out of the water on the side of the hot tub, I started to get that same feeling of being watched that I'd felt from the bathroom window. I would literally break out into goosebumps. It was Friday and we could hear a group of educated I guess, college kids partying hard some distance out but close enough to hear their screams, whoops, and cheers and whatnot. Not wanting to give an intrepid, wood-savvy creeper a show, we decided that we should just go in. 
Not much else happened on night five, but troubled sleep, I think. At one point, Eli woke to frenzied banging on a support post, but it didn't last long or repeat. So night six and the final night. This was an extra night that we'd received due to the piercingly sulfuric water in the cabin. The filters needed replacing and so they comped us a night. The water wasn't dangerous or anything, just really, really stinky. Almost like rotten egg. It was bad, and although our nights were weird, we were on our honeymoon and had just been through a tragedy. We spent our days having massive amounts of fun and doing so many awesome things, plus eating great food and drinking great wine with dinner, and it was an amazing place to visit. So our last night in the hot tub, it was wonderful. Until I start feeling that intense regard from the tree line for the second night in a row. But this time, it's worse. I can actually feel the ill intent in this gaze. But whenever I come up to cool off, I literally find myself unconsciously wrapping my arms around myself and sort of slipping slowly back down into the water. I remind my new husband how many years that he's known me and ask how many times he's known me to be scared or paranoid. I tell him that there is absolutely something aggressive in that tree line looking at me and... It's not a college kid, but we can hear them again tonight. He scoots over and I move to the covered end with him. And within five minutes of me moving, we hear a tremendous crashing from the brush behind us and then something big stomping around directly below us. This is followed a few seconds later by more crashing and a second pair of footsteps stomping around. Strangely, they sounded a bit like human steps, but no one could make such loud noise on the packed earth below the raised deck and cabin like that. We jumped up though, and we immediately booked it inside, soaking wet. Eli says that that night was the worst for the banging. He said that there was banging on at least three widely separated posts, and it went on pretty much all night. He said that when they did let him sleep, the woman would come and... Again, I slept like the dead, unresponsive thing that I was to everything. On the morning of day seven, leaving day, something was demanding my attention, pulling me back towards consciousness, I guess you could say. At first, I thought it was the mounted police or one of the mule-pulled carriages that sometimes passed my place. But no, this was definitely a whole plethora of horses. Was there a parade I didn't know about? Slowly, I remembered I wasn't in New Orleans, and although I was hearing what sounded like hooves, there were no paved roads anywhere near me at that moment, just the small gravel driveway out front. Quickly snapping awake, I realized the sound was coming from the roof of all places. I checked my phone, and it was a few minutes after 8am. I groaned. Why the heck would nobody tell the roofers that the cabin was booked until 11am? I looked over at Eli. He was pale and breathing very slowly now. I half-heartedly poked him a few times, but he was out. Ruefully, I thought of all that he'd been dealing with while I slept as deeply as he seemed to be now, and I just sort of left him alone. I had been with him nearly a decade at this point, and... He had never spoken of things like this before. Whatever had been going on, he deserved some sleep, and at least it was roofers in the sunny morning and not some weird thing at like 4am. At this point, it crossed my mind to wonder what the roofers worked on on Sundays, so I listened closer. It definitely sounded slightly metallic, but I decided my initial impression helped. It honestly sounded like a, a horse was just kicking the heck out of the cabin roof. And I mean, well, what do I know about roofing equipment anyway? Eventually, I would have to ask them to stop until we checked out. I pulled back the covers and swung my legs off the bed. And the instant that my feet touched the floor, the pounding on the roof stopped dead. And the handle to the main door, which was about three to four steps in front of me, started to jiggle violently. Now, two things... There was no pause between the noises. They went from the roof, slightly towards the opposite side of the cabin above where Eli was sleeping, to the doorknob in front of me without any time delay. 
Also, the top half of the door was glass with a sheer curtain which the sun was shining directly through. I could plainly see that there was no one near that door. Yet, I could also see the handle rattling wildly like that. I yanked my feet up and dove under the blankets up to my chin like a kid, I'm ashamed to say. As soon as my feet left the floor, the doorknob stopped though, and the incessant pounding on the roof resumed in the same spot, again with no pause between them during the switch. I'm now staring at Eli, wondering if I should wake him. I'm scared that I won't be able to, but I'm also just as scared that he'll wake up and won't hear it at all. His eyelids flutter open, taking the decision out of my hands. I ask him if he hears that and thank all the gods that he says yes. I'm hesitant to talk about the door when he just opened his eyes, so we talk about what it sounds like first. He also immediately goes to the roofers and I ask if that sounds like a, a hammer to him. And he says no, actually. We agree, though, that it does sound like hooves or something slightly softer than metal. This whole time, I realize that we've automatically been whispering, and this pounding just keeps going on and on. Looking around the cabin, we see the mirror shaking, glasses in the kitchen area rattling, the cabinets quaking. Whatever is on this roof, it shook the walls of the cabin repeatedly. The pounding lasted about 35 minutes because I checked my phone right when it woke me, and right after it stopped, from about 8.02am to 8.36am. Although, I'm not sure how long it's been going on before it woke me, and it was loud and strong and absolutely terrifying, though. We lay whispering for a long time. No way was this a person or people. We started thinking that whatever it was, was trying to bust in through the roof, although the glass doors would surely have been easier to get through. When Eli said that he was going to get up to take a look... I told him about the doorknob shaking when I tried to get up. After a brief hesitation, he threw back his covers and sat up. The pounding stopped. He and I both froze. And then, a terrible grating noise sliding on the roof broke the silence. We both looked at each other with huge eyes and pale faces. Was that claws? I hissed in the quietest voice that I could manage. He leapt back up onto the bed, and the banging resumed. The quietest discussion ever followed about if we'd really just heard claws up there. And we both thought that it was exactly the sound huge claws would make, but really, it could still be anything. Eli grabbed his legally owned firearm from his bedside drawer before quickly standing. The pounding stopped for a second to allow for another grinding rasp to sound across the roof, that is definitely claws, I said. The pounding immediately resumed, twice as fast and even harder if that were possible. I could now feel the thumps reverberating through the bed even. Eli told me to stay inside and listen. Whatever it was, it sounded huge though, and whatever it was, it sounded huge though. And he needed me to let him know what direction that I heard it move, if it ran out of his view up there. He burst out the door and aimed his gun at the roof, and the pounding immediately stopped. There was absolute silence. There was no sound of running anywhere on the roof, and the roof didn't have anything on it. In addition, being perched on the side of the hill as the cabin was, with no trees close, there was really nowhere anything up there could have gone. Well... We packed at max speed after that, but did have one last smoke in the driveway to help with the shaking and the nerves. It was open, so it seemed relatively safe now. While we were smoking, we could hear the people who had been partying the last few nights. They were all out yelling for a missing friend. We heard them yelling about the last time they saw him, which was apparently the night before. We could hear their panic as they screamed his name over and over. Eli and I tried to find the group to help look and ask if they had seen or heard anything weird. However, the winding one-way dirt roads were confusing and we ended up getting lost. We actually think that they may have been locals and we just couldn't get to them because we are on a rental cabin road, which maybe didn't connect to local roads or something. 
Anyway, I really hope that they just found him out there drunk in a bush somewhere or something. Because I sort of regret not being able to locate them and at least help them look a little. I have no idea what that was. All I can say is that nearly every major paranormal thing showed up. From orbs and weird calls and poltergeist activity to cryptid type goings on and the lady in white. Yet it all really did seem like one thing sort of in different outfits if you will. After coming home we had no more weird activity at the time. I did request for the departed to stand witness from a deceased brother who owed me a favor but I specifically requested only the blessed dead and only for the wedding ceremony. This, though, didn't seem like protective ancestors, so I don't think it was necessarily related. In fact, I actually leaned towards some type of nature or elemental type guardian spirit personally, but obviously that is huge conjecture. And although he said differently at the time, Eli now actually thinks that it might have been Bigfoot, although I don't think it was. Anyway, if you made it this far, thanks for your time in listening about my oh-so-memorable honeymoon. If you have any ideas about what we may have encountered, then you're more than welcome to comment. In fact, I would love to hear from anyone about what they might think this is. Thank you, and best wishes with everything. This story is about my father and my uncle, and they had this experience when they were kids. A fair warning, too, it might be a bit lengthy. My father and his older brother, my uncle, they were like best friends from childhood. My father used to live in a joint family, he used to live in a very small village in India. The village is located a bit in the jungle with the population of like 500 to 800 people at the time. Farming was the main occupation with little to no electricity at that time and also a lack of wall clocks so they used to decide their time according to the daylight. It was around 1966 or so. Now I know it sounds a lot like medieval times but that was the situation for tribal people in India. My father then 8 or 10 years old and my uncle then 15 or 16 years old used to get up early in the morning at around 4 in the morning and used to go into the jungle to cut the wood for daily needs like cooking and stuff like that. But before that my aunt, their older sister, used to make some breakfast for them. She either used to pack something for them so that they could eat later or used to deliver the food by herself in early dawn with my grandfather too who used to start with the farm's work. The jungle was near the farms, obviously, and my father and uncle used to go to the familiar area of the jungle, which my aunt was very well aware of. She used to track them down easily enough, have their breakfast together, and then come back together with the woodlocks. Now one day, my uncle and father got up early in the morning as usual. It was still dark and it was winter. Sun rises a bit late during this season. My aunt was still sleeping, so... They decided not to disturb her and they picked up their axes and went for the jungle. That day they decided to go a bit further than usual in the jungle but in reality they went probably too far. They were not even able to see the lantern lights of the village anymore. But they started cutting a tree and gathered little sticks from around the ground and stuff and they got very busy and concentrated for the time being. After about one and a half hours or so my uncle got suspicious over why the sun wasn't rising yet. But by this time, there were supposed to be birds and roosters at least crowing early in the morning. But there was no cattle sounds, no dogs barking, which comes along with the shepherds, and all there was was an eerie deep silence. In fact, it was so silent that my uncle got a bit worried that they got up too early or something. So he started to hurry up his work. Now, before going on any further though, let me be very clear about my uncle. He is a very tough guy. Nothing really scares off this dude easily and he's really respected by the whole village. Same goes for my father too. But this time, it was different. He didn't know why, but he just began feeling like there was something very wrong and something was watching them from deep in the jungle and my uncle knew it better than anyone. 
It was not a tiger, a cheetah, or a jaguar, or a wild boar or anything. He just felt something was wrong that day. And then, all of a sudden, my father and uncle heard the voice of my aunt from a long distance away. They couldn't see her, it was just a voice, but my uncle got very suspicious as the voice was coming from further in the jungle and not from the direction of the village. My uncle told my father to tell her to come to them, so my father responded to her voice and told her to come to them. The voice stopped for a moment and then she replied, No, you come to me. Hurry. I've brought you your favorite food. At this moment, my uncle realized just what it was. He had heard a lot of stories from the villagers of a voice which takes away people, sometimes never to be found again, or if found, will be in a really terrible mental state. The locals used to call such paranormal entities chakva, meaning the paranormal being who will hypnotically fool you to, well, end your own life. As soon as my uncle snapped out of his thoughts, he realized that my father, being a naive kid, had started walking towards the voice and started responding to my aunt's or entity's voice. It was taking my father's name and yelling, come to this direction, I'm here waiting here with your breakfast. My uncle ran towards my father full speed, grabbed him by his shirt collar and said, don't listen to her, come on, we have to get home. My father then said, but it's elder sister, she's calling us and I'm hungry. By that time, my uncle had already grabbed my father's hand and told him that she's bluffing with us. She has no food now. Come on. Now, my father was about to start arguing with my uncle, but then he looked into my uncle's eyes. He looked terrified and his hands were shaking. My father too sensed that something was wrong and started walking fast towards the village without uttering a word. She continued saying, why are you going towards that side? Come here, follow my voice. And my uncle was still holding my father's hand and said, ignore her. She's not coming to us anyway. And there's no need to say that he was trying to divert my father's attention, but he played it cool so that he didn't panic. As they were walking towards the village, they felt as if it was like an eternity to get there. Now, being a Hindu by religion, my uncle started mumbling mantras of Lord Rama, it's a Hindu god, and the voice slowly started to fade away as they were coming close to the village. And my uncle took a long sigh of relief when the dog started barking all of a sudden from the village direction and noticed that some of the village lamps were close by. The whole village dogs gathered together and started barking and making that loud crying or sort of whimpering noise. My uncle reckons that the entity might have still been following them, but who knows. My uncle and father almost started running towards the village upon seeing it, and finally reached it, and the voice was long gone by this point. And finally, there was a sense of relief. My uncle stopped near our ancestral temple, joined his hands together, bowed his head and said thank you. My father was still confused about the whole situation, but once they reached home... My uncle and father, they both saw that my aunt, she was still in her bed. My father, being a naive kid at the time, cursed her for beating them in the race. Turns out, though, that they both left the house way too early, as in like 2 o'clock in the morning, or even earlier, possibly. And it was a no-moon night, so it was incredibly dark. My father had a fever for a few days after that, which was a bit strange, but when my aunt told him that she didn't get up that morning, let alone make them food, my grandfather and uncle, they knew exactly what had happened, and they were thankful, and are still thankful, to this day. When I was five, my family attended a church with two stories. Downstairs were the nursery and the Sunday school rooms. Upstairs was the main church room where the service was held, as well as some offices, a kitchen, and a library. Now, the main doors opened into a stairway connecting the two levels. Then after Sunday school, kids would either continue playing downstairs until their parents came to get them, or... If they were old enough and impatient to go home, like me, they could go and find their parents upstairs and try to convince them to stop talking and leave. My mum, 
She would spend what felt like hours talking to people after the service, so sometimes I would just go up and down the stairs a couple of times, up to ask if we could leave, back down to play when she said not yet. Repeat again maybe 10 minutes later, I think. One Sunday during one of my trips up the stairs, there was an elderly couple standing outside the glass doors, smiling and waving at me. I remember thinking, maybe they'd been locked out somehow and wanted to come in, which was a silly thing to think since the doors were never locked during the hours the church was open. But wanting to be helpful, I went and I opened the door and told them that they could come in. Turns out they didn't want to come in and instead told me that... They were my grandparents, there to pick me up. That really confused me as I was very familiar with both sets of my grandparents and these people were not either of them. I told them that no, they weren't my grandparents. At that point I was thinking that they just had me confused for another kid and said so. They then quickly stated that they meant that they were my great grandparents and we hadn't met since I was a baby so I wouldn't remember them and my parents had asked them to drive me home since they were busy. Now, even if I hadn't been smart enough to realize that they could have just come in if they wanted, that at least seemed odd to me, and even as they protested it wasn't necessary, I said that I was going to ask my parents and headed up the stairs. My mum was still talking to a group of churchgoers, but after literally tugging on her sleeve for probably a minute, I think, I was able to finally get her attention and announce loudly, and at that point probably impatiently, that my great-grandparents were there to pick me up and I was supposed to go with them. She looked confused and concerned and told me my great-grandparents were not there to pick me up since they were all dead, which pretty quickly put a stop to the discussion about raising money for a stained glass window or whatever it was. My mum and some of the other adults went with me back to the door, but the couple was no longer there. Since I couldn't really describe them any better than old, white hair, looked friendly but not my grandparents, it was just sort of uneasily put down to them mistaking me for somebody else. From then on, despite my impatience to leave, I stayed downstairs until my parents came and got me. I remember being concerned about it for a while at least, but my mum would discourage discussing it, saying that they just made a mistake. It is possible that that's all it was, but I've always remembered that it felt wrong how insistent that they were, that they were there to pick me up. Whatever the case, it's something that I'll never forget. This was earlier this year, late last year. For some context, I live right across from a state park. My family has lived here pretty much our whole lives. I'm fifth generation in this house and it's a very quaint, quiet road, mostly filled with grandparents and the recently retired. And the park is always filled with cute families and their dogs taking a stroll and stuff. Basically, nothing ever weird really happens here. Now, with that being said, one night, 9 to 10 p.m. ish, my friend wants me to come over and hang out with her and discuss her wedding. She lives maybe two minutes away, and it sounds like fun, so I'm on my way. From the driveway, if you turn left, it's pretty open and the trees don't cover much of the road. However, if you turn right, there's a lot of trees on either side that make the road darker than it already is since our road has no street lamps. To go to my friend's house, I have to turn right, and as I'm going down the road, I notice a figure of a man. Tall, slim, dark clothing, backpack, possibly long hair, walking the opposite side of the road. This is strange because I've never seen anyone walk this late at night, but as I get closer, I notice that he's walking backwards, just staring at me. Obviously, I sort of slow down a bit because I don't want to possibly hit the man. But as I passed him, he kept complete soul-piercing eye contact with me whilst still walking backwards. I got immediate chills down my spine and my stomach turned into a bottomless pit. 
and once my neck couldn't turn anymore, I sped off and ran through the stop sign because uh, I didn't want any possibility of him getting closer to me. I've just never gotten such a bad vibe from a human in my life before, and it was just terrifying. Uh, I didn't see him again on the way back home, and actually have no idea if he wanted to hitch a ride or what his deal was. But why was he staring me down like prey, and why was he walking backwards like that? Uh, I guess I'll just never really know. So, about a year or maybe a year and a half ago, I was sleeping on a normal day like any other. I had a dream that I was in a tiny red room that had no windows nor any doors. I was sat on a wooden chair in the middle of that room and out of nowhere a scrawny, ugly demon approached me. He looked me dead in the eyes and said, give me your soul, I'll give you anything your heart desires, fame, money, power, you name it. In all honesty, I gave a good thought, but eventually I denied the offer. The demon replied slightly annoyed, I will not ask you again, think carefully. But this time I didn't even bother to think about it though, and I just said no. The demon then let out the most horrifying scream that I've ever heard, as if someone was killing a human and a goat at the same time or something. It's the only way I can describe this scream, but I immediately woke up. I was sweating and I felt as if my head was about to explode. I was sort of looking around the room when I looked at my door frame to see a silhouette of a person standing there. I nearly jumped off my bed before I heard my dad's voice and he said that he ran to my room because he heard my screaming and rushed to see if I was okay. I told him that I just had a bad dream and that he had nothing to worry about. He then asked me what the dream was about because I screamed way too loud. I sighed and told him what I was dreaming about. A demon who wanted my soul in an exchange for money and power and stuff. And he said, so, did you accept the offer? I was at a loss for words for a second before I replied, what? No, you're one of the most religious people I know. Out of all the people to ask me this? And then he just said, you're an idiot and then just went back into the hallway. I was in all honesty beyond ticked off at this point, and I got up from the bed to go to his bedroom to confront him about it. So I enter his room and turn the lights on to see that there's no one. I was like, well, maybe he's gone to the kitchen, but again, nothing. The kitchen was empty. In fact, I searched the whole house, and he was nowhere to be found. Then the reality hit me as I sort of just froze in fear. I remembered that he was out of town for a few days for work. So, who was that? To this day, whenever this is brought up, it's so odd that we just all agree that We'll never know or perhaps understand what happened. 22 years ago on Halloween, my high school girlfriend, myself and two friends were driving around. I was the first with the car and we always were depressed 90s kids that would listen to Smiths or Goth Rock and before we could drive, we'd meet up at the graveyard and hang out. So it's Halloween, we couldn't have been past 9pm. I drive into the graveyard which is sprawling. Lots of mausoleums and graves and a big patch of land weighing the back with hills and not much else. This was the scariest part of the graveyard, mind you. Probably because it was secluded and away from the street and headlights of cars. But we drive and see the usual graves that we always see. My girlfriend says that we should drive all the way in the back, and we do. But then, as the car crests this one hill... We see candles and obviously people, but they all have animal masks on. They all immediately start running to their cars, but not in fear. I couldn't see anyone's face, but everyone was wearing black and they seemed excited, if I had to guess. Not afraid. I locked the doors, 
We watched them get in their cars, about seven in total, and being dumb and bored, we decided to follow them. But we think it'll be hilarious to follow them. I mean, where are they going? Is there a cult? Who cares, right? We're just bored teenagers. As we followed them, they begin to head out further to a place called Burnt Store Road. The street name is self-explanatory. There was a store once, and it was burnt down. But now the scary thing is that we're all laughing and starting to get creeped out. We're getting more into a sort of desolate area with no streetlights. No houses were even out there at this time. As we're following the cars, we see the one furthest up ahead turn on their blinker goes left but then every car turned on their left blinker in perfect time with the other car the first car turns on the blinker and before it can even blink three times the next car has theirs on too what was weird though is that all of the blinkers synced up perfectly and at that we sort of all stopped laughing because it was a bit strange still following we take a side road that goes to well who knows where the music is turned down and now we're discussing just turning around. The feeling in the air was just ominous quite suddenly. But we follow them for about maybe another mile with all their blinkers still synced up perfectly mind you. And they begin driving up this, not a hill but a very large constructed almost sand dune looking thing. This was the time where the land was being dug up to make a river or something. I stopped the car, I decided that this was all too weird and... But we don't want to see what's on the hill with these weird circus clown cars with all their blinkers going. So we turn around and we begin going back the way that we came from, which is still miles and miles of nothing. No street lights, no house lights, not even lines for lanes in the road or anything. The miles tick by though and the mood lightens a bit I suppose. But we start laughing and playing music again and as a joke, I flick off my high beams because, well, I'm an idiot. And my girlfriend finally has enough and yells to turn my lights back on. And the first thing that we see is a very large old clawfoot bath directly blocking our path, taking up what would be two lanes of the road. And that tub was definitely not there the first time that we drove out. There was only one way in or out of this place where we were going. We get out of the car cautiously and nothing is funny anymore. We moved the tub with a lot of effort off the road. If a car hit it, it would have been an absolute disaster for sure. But we all got home safely, thankfully. But I often ask myself, were those animal mask people baiting us? Did they purposefully just wait for people to find them and then have someone place the tub there like that? And the blinker synchronization was just so odd. Along with this giant-like hill that those cars were so swiftly driving up. I don't know, the whole night was weird and the whole thing felt a bit like a setup, but what do you guys think? Am I just overthinking it?